right, as you're being seated and settling in, I uh, want to let everybody know if you haven't uh, noticed in the bulletin, uh, we've made announcements that uh, we're now doing live stream of our shows over the internet, uh, shows, uh, services, <laughs> it is a show, da 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 da, uh, some days are more of a show than others, uh, hopefully we're showing what Jesus has done in our life and showing the change that he can bring, and so I want to welcome all of those that are uh, tuning in this morning and uh, watching via the internet. And uh, I want to give a shout out to my daughter, Emily, who is uh, turning 31 today up in Nashville. And um, if you're tuning in by live stream this morning, you get a better present than if you skip church. So just letting you know. And uh, uh, it's, it's a blessing so you can access that if you know someone. Uh, who uh, would be blessed by that or isn't able to be here, they can uh, check it out online and uh, enjoy and participate. But I don't think it will capture the same uh, intensity and enthusiasm that we experienced this morning. Uh, we brought a little motion home from motion. Can you say amen? Isn't that awesome? And so, uh, I, and I got some extra help here today. Because we're, we're in a uh, series of messages from Psalm 27 called I Declare. And we're making seven faith declarations over our life based on uh, different sections and, and verses out of Psalm 27. And so the challenge that I made to all of you uh, as we began this, who those who were here, was that we memorize Psalm 27. And, and, and some of you said, man, I don't know if I can do it. And so... So I got some, some experts here, and uh, they're going to help me this morning because they've got it memorized. Now, the whole thing, or just, we're going to just do the first part? Well, Down through gonna, verse. We're going to go from one to five. And one to five, and then six by herself. Okay? So, so how many of y'all think you can do it? Okay, so what, here's what we're going to do. They're going to lead us. And we're going to all say it together. Now, you, you, you do have an exemption if you're a first-timer and, and you haven't been working on it. But what we'll realize is that putting God's Word in our heart, memorizing Scripture is one of the most powerful things we can do in our life. God's promise is that every uh, word of Scripture that we hide in our heart, He'll call back to our remembrance. And so your memory might not be what it used to be, but the Holy Spirit does not change. And, and he can call things to your remembrance that you didn't even know could, could be recalled. And, and so this morning, as we go down through, uh, I want him to help us. Uh, and so let's do the first uh, verses, and then I'll uh, share with you our verse today. And so we've talked about the first uh, eight verses so far. And so they're going to help us as we recite that together. Come on, can we do it? Are you all nervous? They're not nervous. They're confident because they know it. I got some good help. And if they do a great job, I'll just let them help me every week. How about that? Are you ready, guys? Okay, Psalm 27. Take it ready. away. Ready? Okay. <laughs> the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked advance against me to devour me, it is my enemies and my foes who will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then I will be confident. One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and seek him in his temple. For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in a shelter of the sacred tent and set me high upon a rock. Then my head will be exalted above the enemies who surround me. Amen. <laughs> I will sacrifice with shout to joy and and, and, sing, and sing and make music to the Lord. Hallelujah. Awesome. 
And so from that, we make declarations out of our life. Do y'all remember what our declarations are? I will live life strong. Come on, you say it now. I will live life strong. Number two is I will love God's house passionately. Come on, everybody. I will love God's house passionately. Number three, I will hold my head high. I will hold my head high. Number four that we talked about last week is watermelon, watermelon, watermelon. is there you go i will live life with an overflowing heart amen all right you guys want to go down good job thanks 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 wonderful and so today we're looking at verses 9 and 10 of psalm 27 And we're looking today, our declaration is, I will turn to God at all times. I will turn to God at all times. And and here's how powerful that is. Um, We had a great illustration of that this morning, just with the the young people and the leaders who were at Motion. Um, Motion was a youth conference that uh, sponsored by Church of the Highlands uh, this past week in Birmingham. Uh, over 7,500 uh, students were there in the BJCC, downtown Birmingham. Awesome time of worship, uh, great time of messages. There were some breakout sessions and small groups. But I want you to know that not every one of these kids who were there, certainly not every one of the 7,500 kids w- was there because they wanted to be. Some of them were there and, and they weren't in a great place in their life. Some of them were there and they were having struggles. Some of those kids who were there, their parents were having struggles. Some of them who were there were going through some really, really difficult times. Some of our kids as well, there were challenges even with schedule and, and commitment. Do we want to go or this came up or that came up? How many of you know that just happens in life? But I want you to see the result of in the midst of struggles, in the midst of trials, in the good times and the bad times and the times when it's fun, the times when it's not, the times when our hearts are really open to God and the times when we're tempted to hide because of sin that's crept into our life, that at every time when our hearts turn to God, God meets us. And then we don't have to walk in shame. We don't have to experience disgrace. We don't have to hide. We don't have to, to hold back and be, be timid. But we can be bold for the Lord. We can worship him openly. We can express our love and and our passion, our joy to the Lord through our song, through our gestures, through our lifestyle that's lived. And how many of you know that's a very contagious thing? And so I want you to know this morning, no matter where you are, what you're walking through, that if we'll choose and declare and determine my heart will turn to God at all times. Now, why is that important to make a declaration? Scripture compares the relationship that God wants to have with us to a husband and a wife, to a marriage relationship. In fact, God's term for us as those who choose to follow him are the bride of Christ. His church is his bride. And Christ came and gave himself for her and Christ came and prepared this bride and removed spots and stains and wrinkles, if you will. It's what sin leaves in our life, but he purifies this bride for himself and then calls her to himself, all of us, to to live, and he symbolizes it with a marriage relationship. Now, how many of you know our marriage relationships, uh, especially if they're based spiritually and not just a civil ceremony, are, are confirmed with vows. I see some newlyweds over here and several of you in the uh, uh, auditorium this morning that uh, stood on this platform or even in the old building or somewhere and led your wedding ceremony. And the key component of that is that you made vows one to another. And I'm here to tell you as a pastor, I'm here to tell you as a husband, uh, I'm here to tell you as a person who has experience in that area. There's not one marriage relationship 
on the planet that's ever been that hasn't experienced times of challenge or difficulty or struggle. Some of them shattered, some of those devastated. And it's the people who determine, wait, in the midst of that, where am I going to turn? Is my heart going to turn away from my partner? Or is my heart going to turn back toward the vows that I declared before them? And am I going to stand together and I'm going to walk those out? It's why it's so important that we make declarations over our lives. It's one thing to, to, to have music or to have songs or to have an expression. There's different things that people do in a wedding ceremony. But I make sure that every couple that uh, we marry here and that goes through our counseling understands that there's a strong difference between a promise and a pledge and a vow. That, that it's one thing to stand and read a love letter to one another, but you're not necessarily committed to that because those are feelings and your heart can change. But when you say, I vow before God to love you in sickness and in health, in richer and in poorer, uh, for better or for worse, uh, for the rest of my life here on this earth, so long as we both shall live, so help me God. That, that the vow then is the thing that keeps you rather than you working really hard to keep the vow. And when your heart turns away because of hurt or pain or misunderstanding or, or you are poorer when you really wanted to be richer, or you don't understand and your expectations were really placed in this person who has no way of meeting those expectations, especially if you don't know what they are yourself. And so you're disappointed and then fear enters in, then the enemy enters in, then fence enters in, and the accuser of the brethren begins to slander that other person in our heart saying, see, they didn't really love you, they didn't keep their vow, they didn't mean it, they weren't true, they weren't faithful, so you don't have to be either. I wouldn't open my heart to them. I wouldn't forgive them. But if your heart turns back to the vows that you made before God and that your heart is established in him, there's nothing that shall be impossible with God. There's nothing you can't make it through, nothing you can't walk through. But listen, if your heart turns to other things, that you want to find another person that, that's going to love you better than the one you had. If your heart turns to drugs or alcohol or something else to dull the pain that you're experiencing rather than walking through, embracing that in God and saying, Lord, meet me here and heal me. I made a vow. I made a declaration and I want to walk that out. Listen, when your heart turns back to God, God will turn your heart back to the word and the declaration of your life will be solid ground when it seems like you're in the midst of an earthquake or a whirlwind, you don't know what to believe, you don't know where to turn. In fact, in life's most difficult moments, sometimes as a pastor, you, you have the honor and the privilege of being there, but it's also a little bit awkward. Because the number one question that people ask over and over and over again, the statement that they make and they express it in different ways, but it comes down to this. If you could rephrase people's biggest question about life in difficulty, in a disaster, in loss, in brokenness, in their hurt, in their pain, in their disappointment, it's this, where am I going to turn? Where do I turn? Great question. We, we, we use a phrase in the church, Jesus is the answer. That's more than a cliche. It should be more than some, a, a phrase on a bumper sticker. It should be something that we declare in our heart. Listen, if Jesus is the answer, and he is, in all things, that means that whatever test comes into your life is easy because you already have the answer. If Jesus is the answer, when the test comes, you'll pass with 100%. If Jesus is the answer in your heart and you've already declared that, Lord, my heart's not going to turn away. My heart's not going to turn to the world. My heart's not going to look toward people. My heart's not going to look for anything outside other than you. My heart is going to turn to you at all times. And when we do, God said, because my heart has already turned toward you. His word declares, you will seek me and find me when you seek with all your heart. Here's a better one, that the prophet came in the Old Testament, the book of Second Chronicles, and he speaks a word over Asa's life, who was a king. 
And he started out great and he made some great reforms. But then his heart turned away from God and he made, in a time of distress, he went and made a covenant, a commitment with another earthly king. And he said, hey, let's make a peace treaty so, so, that, so that if troubles come, then, then, then you'll be there to help me. And, and the prophet came and he spoke over Asa's life and he said, you've done a wicked thing. God said to you, if you seek me, you'll find me. But if you forsake me, then you'll be forsaken. And then he says these words, for the eyes of the Lord search the entire earth to and fro, seeking someone whose heart is totally devoted to him. And when God finds that person, God will pour his heart out toward them as well. See, it's not just the fact that we seek God in difficult times. It's the fact that God's already seeking us. God already sees what we can't see yet. God already knows what we don't know. And he's not trying to trick us. He's not trying to, to, to deceive us in any way. He's letting us know, look, I'm there. And if our hearts turn to God in the darkness, our hearts turn to God in loss, our hearts turn to God in grief, our hearts turn to God and so that we don't even take credit. One of the uh, players at the induction ceremony y yesterday said uh, that, that his, his family taught him to be humble, to walk in humility. And he said, humility is this. It's not thinking less of yourself. It's just thinking of yourself less. It, it's putting yourself second in, instead of promoting yourself to be first. It's playing for other people, not just playing for the glory and the credit yourself. He said, I never once asked, coach, throw me the ball, throw me the ball. I never went to the other guys on my team saying, hey, I'm open, throw it to me. But he was saying, what do we need to do to score a touchdown? He said, he'd look in the other guy's eyes and say, come on, let's make this happen. I love that when God looks and he sees a heart that's not looking for the credit or for the glory. It's not looking in his desperation just for a way out or a handout is looking for God to come and God to help because Lord, as we look to you, you are our help and our strength. In fact, the Psalms goes one step further and says, Lord, we need you to be our help because the help of man is useless. How many of you have ever found that to be true? See, it's one thing for people to be there and to be present in your life. It's another thing for them to show up and actually have a desire to help. And to follow through. If you don't believe that, uh, just ask a few friends over and then remind them after, oh yeah, by the way, we're moving. We just wanted you to come over. Do you want them to come over or do you want them to come over and help? See, there's a big difference between being around people and, and, and looking to people for help or having people who can help us. Now, as the body of believers in the New Testament, we are to do that. We're to meet needs. We're to anticipate, we're to live with our eyes open and our hearts open toward people. We're to serve those who can't serve themselves. We're to look on the least of these and the greatest of these. But we're to look to God at all times and turn our heart to him for the help we need in every situation. How many of you know when we do that, God's gonna be there? All right, come on, now let's, let's look at that and make our declaration in our heart. I will, my heart will turn to God at all times. What does that mean on a practical basis? Let me tell you a story, true story actually, about a businessman who, who was enjoying life, loving God, raising a great family, had five children, uh, four daughters and a son, and a uh, beautiful wife, very successful business. Uh, he had just moved in to, moved his business into a new uh, location. Everything was looking great. They were doing well. And the first blow that came into his life was when his son died suddenly and unexpectedly. And it devastated him and them. They walked through that grief and just a few months later, his entire business was completely destroyed by fire. Burned it to the ground and lost everything. And as a result, he had sent his wife and four daughters on a cruise ship, actually a passage over the ocean and they, the ship got caught in a storm and it sank and all four of his daughters drowned. Now, one blow, we can make it. Two blows, we can get back to our feet and recover. But three blows, four blows, four at once, 
and he was devastated. The businessman's name was Horatio. His last name was Spafford. You may not know the name, but I bet you know the song that he wrote in the midst of his grief and in his pain. It said, when peace like a river attends my soul, yet sorrows like sea billows roll. Whatever my lot, you have taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. The bodies of his four daughters were never recovered. His business never re recovered. Certainly his son never recovered. They were lost. But yet he wanted to be at the place and pay memorial. So standing out on the bow of the ship in the fog as it crossed the spot where the other ship had gone down, all four of his daughters losing their lives at once, he stood there and penned the words of that song, It Is Well, on the bow of that ship. What a strength it is for us. One of the verses of that song says, Though Satan should buffet. To buffet is, is to just punch and slug and slap around. Though Satan should buffet, though trials should come, let this blessed assurance control. Let this blessed assurance control my attitude, my thoughts, my words. Let it control my heart and turn it back to God. That, that my heart will turn back to the Lord is what he's saying. God's not against me. God's for me. This, isn't the, this may be the worst thing that can ever happen to me, but God is the greatest thing that's ever happened to me. And so I'm going to turn my heart back to God. And here, out of one man's buffeting, out of one man's incredible pain, out of the blows of his life, he didn't surrender, he didn't quit, he wasn't knocked out. He used it as an opportunity when he turned his heart back to God to bring healing and to bring comfort to thousands upon thousands worldwide since that event. See, when we turn our hearts toward God, God's heart is already turned toward us. God wants to give us his strength. God wants to give us his power. God wants to meet us with his presence. God wants to give us wisdom. God wants to help us make decisions. God wants to help bring comfort so that we don't have to find it in illicit places, that we can find it totally and completely in him. God doesn't even want us looking to other people because we're faulted. We, we're, we, we're limited. We're finite. We don't have unlimited resources. God said, I do. That, that we don't have unlimited power. God said, I do. We don't even know. We have limits to our love. God said, I don't. God so loved the world that he demonstrated it in ways that people are still trying to comprehend it. And some people are offended by the very cross that Jesus used to express the heart of the Father to his children. To this day, why Jesus would say, blessed are those who are not offended in me. Because if we allow our hearts to be offended, they turn away from God. Sometimes in our trials, we think God turned away from us. But if we make a declaration in our heart that at all times, my heart will turn to God, that we will find everything we need in the time in which we need it. Is anybody with me this morning? All right, last week we talked about our, our declaration was, I will live with an overflowing heart. W what does an overflowing heart sound like? An overflowing heart isn't just filled with praise. If we're going to live with an overflowing heart, that means our heart needs to overflow at every time unto God, no matter what we're walking through. We don't always understand where we are in life, why we're there, what has happened to us. We don't understand other people's words or actions or whatever it might be. But listen, God said if we'll turn our hearts to him, he will give us an understanding. He will help us find this solid place. And the overflowing heart that David exemplifies for us here in these next two verses that we're going to look at in Psalm 27 in verses 9 and 10 is a heart that overflows with honest prayer. A heart that overflows with honest prayer. 
When David says, God, I need you to help me. I need you to be here with me. God, don't leave me. Don't forsake me. It's not expressions based in fear, but David's heart is overflowing with the confident declaration of his need. God, I need you. And and I need to be able to see you right here with me. One of the verses in the Psalms, they said, God, we need your help and we need a speedy answer. How many of you have ever prayed that prayer? Didn't even know you were quoting scripture. I need an answer and I need it now. God, I know that, that you're, you know, the suddenlies of God. I need a suddenly. I need an answer now. And it's not a demanding thing. It's this desperation of, God, I got to hear from you. And sometimes other people pose the deadlines and God turns the deadline into a lifeline. And he said, if you'll turn your heart to me, I'll give you an answer before you even ask. And so here, David expresses his heart, his overflowing heart to God when he prays honest prayers. And there are five expressions that I listed there in your notes of an overflowing heart to God and how that's uh, exemplified by uh, David and how it's expressed to him. So let's look at that this morning. Here in verses uh, 9 and 10 of Psalm 27, let's read it together. The New Living Translation says this. Do not turn your back on me. Do not reject your servant in anger. You have always been my helper. Don't leave me now. Don't abandon me, O God of my salvation. And then he makes this statement. Even if my father and mother abandon me, the Lord will hold me close. What's the question? Where do you turn? Where does your heart turn in trouble? Where do you turn in the midst of a trial? Where do you turn when you're tempted? Do you turn to yourself, your own strength? Do you turn to darkness so that you can hide and hope that, that others won't know or, or won't see? It's what Adam and Eve did. And God's heart was for them. God walks in, in his presence is no darkness at all, that God is light. And he opens that way because God always wants to be our help, our strength. God wants to be there for us. So here's the five expressions uh, for that, that David declared in verses 9 and 10. And I think they're important for us to express back to God out of an overflowing heart as well. The first one is, don't hide from me. Don't hide from me. David wasn't just saying, God, I need you here. He, he was really saying, I need to see you. I need to see that you're here. It's not demanding. It's not out of fear. It's not that sense where God hides. But if God does hide, it's simply because you'll seek him and he's already promised if you seek me, you'll find me. And there's parts of our heart sometimes that we need to turn to God. That, that, that needs to turn to him instead of other things. We always kind of have this plan B. With God, there's no such thing. There's plan G, God. That's it. That's one. Jesus is the answer. Not Jesus and Jesus. And when our hearts turn to God, we see God in ways that we never understood. Because if we had, we would have obviously turned to him. Sometimes God uses those times where it seems like he's hiding so that we'll seek him a little more intensely with our heart. And God's not saying, no, you know, you can do a little bit better. That it's, you know, it's not a fitness test. It's the fact that God wants to reveal our hearts to us. He already knows them. And he doesn't reject us. He doesn't turn us away. But he wants us to know, hey, this is in your heart. God, where are you? I'm right here. Why can't I see you? I'm not hiding. When I got saved in 1977, I didn't have a Bible. I'd never been to church, not once in my life. Um, Actually, two times, years before. Uh, No one had ever shared the gospel with me. Our family didn't pray together. Uh, None of those things. And so the the kids in the youth group went together after I got saved and bought me my first Bible. And it was a living Bible. Uh, Some of you who've been around for a while, it had a, a big thing on the cover. It said, One Way. 
And inside that, then they all wrote little things, words of encouragement to me, some scripture, some whatever. But one of the kids in that youth group wrote in that uh, Bible, I still have it, if you ever feel far from God, guess who moved? I don't know how many times I came back to that when the, the, the new wore off of this new life. And where it was a lot more about Mike than Jesus. And there were challenges that I faced and, and difficulties, but I've come back to that over and over again when it seems like God's hiding. God's a long way off. Or I'm tempted to pray, God, where are you? And if I listen, he'll always tell me. You know, it's really boring to play hide and seek with God because you'll never win. If God hides, you ain't gonna find him. Now, if you hide from him, <laughs> that's, that's no contest. Just like Adam did. They thought they could hide behind fig leaves, then they thought they could hide behind a tree. If you're God and you made a tree, you can see through a tree. It's like, hello. But, but when we call to God, God answers us. But sometimes he's not where we expect him to be. Sometimes when the tr trouble lasts a little too long, or the pain goes a little deeper than we thought it would, or the loneliness begins to settle in, we have a tendency to say, God, are you hiding? Almost like it's a game or a trick. God, this isn't fair. And it's not the fact that we just say, God, I need you. What we're really expressing in our heart, the overflowing heart is, I need you right here, right now. And what a powerful thing it is when God says, not only am I present, Excuse me, not only do I give you my presence, but I'm present. I'm there. I'm in the midst. He comes into the situation and says, there's no need to be lonely because not only am I God and I'm everywhere all at the same time, I'm omnipresent, but I'm personally present to you. I'm present in your pain. I'm present in the misunderstanding. I'm present in the midst of the argument that you're going back and forth because you can't hear one another's heart. And if you take a minute and let your heart turn toward me, th then, then I'm going to be right there. I'm going to meet you there right in that moment. And so that's what David said. He'd already expressed to him that he had, uh, he's facing enemies, no fear. That, that he's in the midst of turmoil and struggles. But he said, God, my heart is confident. If an army besiege me, standing in confidence in you. He's already expressed, God, my heart and my passion is one thing have I desired. I just want to be in your house. It's one thing for you to be in the house. It's another thing for God to be in the house when you're in the house. Are you with me here? Have, ever, have anybody ever asked you to house sit? And, and great friends, whatever, and you know all the stuff and you're taking care of it and just, you know, but it's not the same if they're not there. See, it's one thing for you to be in the same place. It's another thing for, for people to be there while you're there. That God didn't just say, uh, I'm, I'm going to be available to you, but I'll be out of town for a few days. God said, I'm an ever-present help in time of trouble. And God steps into the trouble with you. God steps into the grief. God steps into life and, and meets you right where you are and walks you through it. Isn't that an awesome thing? So, so the first thing David cried out of his overflowing heart was, Lord, don't, don't hide from me. Second thing he said was, and, and don't hide from me by turning away from me or, or not being there for me, but Lord, don't be angry with me. The, the, the root of so many of our so much of our distress in society, in life today, us, ours, right here, 2014, is a spirit of rejection and abandonment, which causes us to feel unloved or unworthy. And it's because of a lot of things, sometimes people's choices, uh, the di disintegration of family, uh, long-term relationships and, and uh, the, the breakdown of that. 
And so instead of turning to God, people are turning to a lot of things to cope, to, to deal with the stress, deal with the pain, deal with the loss, uh, deal with themselves. Um, families are breaking down and therapy sessions are skyrocketing. Nothing wrong with that. That's great. But, but nobody can help you like the counselor, the Holy Spirit, who wants to meet with you and walk with you. So here, David just said, God, it's not like I need you to be here. I, I, I need you to be here. I, I don't need you to hide. I need to be able to see you here. And, and I need you to talk with me, but not be angry with me. How many of you know the scripture says, the anger of man does not work the righteousness of God? David declared in the Psalms that God's anger lasts for a moment, but his favor lasts for a lifetime. See, it was this deal of, okay, sometimes when we respond out of anger, it, it, it puts a, more of a barrier, more of a difficulty there. Uh, recently, Elliot and I were uh, having a uh, time of intense fellowship out, out in the front yard. And uh, that, that's our term for anger. And, and I, I was frustrated uh, because of something he did. He never gets frustrated with me, but I was frustrated. And so my response to him, it, it, he, he stopped and he said, Dad, don't be angry with me. And it was that, that deal of, man, you're right. And so the wisdom of that, and, and I appreciated the courage that it took just for him to say, don't, don't be angry with me. What he was, was he really saying? I, I take full responsibility for what I did. I don't even remember what it was now. And it doesn't matter because that's usually the way it is in life, that, that people make mistakes. Sometimes people we totally trust, sometimes people close to us, sometimes people we wouldn't expect, but they do. And how do we respond to that? And if we respond to it, we can be angry, but it's why Paul said in Ephesians 5, listen, you can be angry, but in your anger, don't sin. And sometimes the harshness of that or the words that we choose when our hearts don't turn to God in our anger is the same feeling that we get from God. Here's what David was expressing. God, don't hide from me, but don't, don't be angry with me. That, that I, I can't, I don't want to hear your anger what I want to hear is your heart. What I want to hear and have is your help. Come on, somebody. Am I getting through to you today? See, it's the same thing. If I took the tone this morning, and, and you've been in meetings probably where, where somebody's preaching and the intensity is one thing, but if they're mad at you, and then the whole deal is you're a bad person and, and God's ticked at you, and if you don't get it straightened up, you're going to burn in hell. Well, the reality of that is a life separated from God, that's the end result. God doesn't send people to hell. People send themselves to hell because their hearts won't turn to him. Listen to that. See, but if we put that on God or, or, or we're, we, we can't respond to a message of God's grace because of the way that it's communicated, and I think many times as the church at large, we communicate a message of love with an angry tone. And so we present an image that God's mad at y'all, but he loves us. And it's a mixed message. And so people struggle with that. Okay, it went on to say that, that parents are not only to be... Uh, or fathers not just angry with their kids, we're not to be harsh with them because it exasperates them. Think about that. The tone. That we can say things, we can speak the truth in love, we can communicate accurately, we can say, I'm very angry with you. But when we take on the harshness of words and don't say what we really mean and don't release that out of our heart, that it, it exasperates the child. It's what David was feeling with the Lord. Lord, don't express your anger uh, to me in this situation. I, I need you here in the midst of this. My heart is overflowing. I need your help. I need you to be here with me. God, I need you to father me. 
I need you to help me. Don't be harsh with me. Be helpful to me. Wasn't just asking God to be nice. He was just saying, God, who can stand in your anger? Then he said, not only was it that expression overflowing of don't hide from me, don't be angry with me. Number three, then David's uh, heart overflowed. You've always been my help. And so he was saying, don't stop helping me. That when uh, an overflowing heart turns to God, we have a constant stream, a constant flow of God's help. And so here he wasn't saying, just expressing the fact that he's totally needy. God, I can't do anything for myself. I'm totally dependent upon you. Help me, help me, help me, help me, help me. Keep on helping me. Don't ever quit helping me. It wasn't the, the context. He said it confidently. God, you have always been my help. Always. Faithful, consistent, solid. You've been there when I wanted you there. You've been there when I didn't. You've always been that. You've always been present. You've always been steady. You've always been my strength, my confidence. You've always helped me with my fear. You've always helped me overcome. Father, you helped me with a a bear. You helped me defeat a lion. You helped me defeat a giant. You helped me defeat your enemies and my enemies. You helped me overcome betrayal from my own family. You helped me overcome uh, uh, when the king tried to kill me. Lord, you have rescued my life over and over and over again. And so it was this sense of gratitude and dependency upon God. I don't want to do it in my own strength. God, I need your help. Don't stop helping me. I mentioned as we began uh, the message from 2 Chronicles 15. In fact, I think I put the wrong, uh, I think I put 1 Chronicles 15 uh, as a reference in your Bible. It's 2 Chronicles 15. It's the account of Asa. And, and if you back up uh, into verse 14, it, it kind of gives some history that the, there was tremendous chaos. There was all kinds of turmoil. Um, Asa uh, becomes king, and he begins to make some reforms and, and help in practical ways, and he fortified cities and all of that. But the first thing that's recorded that Asa says to God in prayer after he becomes king is that God, you have always been our help. And I look to you for your strength. Guide me and lead us as we honor you. And then the prophet comes to him in chap- the beginning of chapter 15 and, and he speaks to him and he says uh, that, that not only is God gonna be with you and, and God gonna bless us, God's gonna help us because you have a heart after him. And that God strengthens that and and that God sees it. But he says there's also this time where there was no uh, priest to teach. That there was no uh, prophet in the land to proclaim the word of the Lord. And it was not safe for them to even travel outside of their cities because of all the chaos and and the the terror, if you will. And this describes our society, doesn't it? Not safe to travel, not safe to go outside because of all this chaos that's going on. And he says, but here, my mark, my help for you, he said that he was going to establish Asa's kingdom and they were going to have peace. And for 10 years, they had no war. Peace was established in the land. The people's hearts were secure. They were confident. But then when Asa made this covenant and went outside, instead of continuing to turn to God, who was the one who said, God, you've always been our help. And and when we turn to you, you're always there for us. You're faithful to us. But when his heart turned away from God and looked to another king, looked to an army, looked to their strength for their security and help, then the word of the Lord comes and says, you can't do that. God's your help. God's your strength. And so then, again, the, 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 the kingdom was thrown into this place of turmoil. I talked about the spirit of rejection. And, and it said that when the prophet came to speak that word to Asa, that Asa was angry with him. Asa was angry with the prophet who came to tell him what God said. So he wasn't open to the word of God. His heart wasn't turned to God's word. His heart, in fact, turned away. And, and he threw that prophet in prison and then it said 
and he treated many others brutally and harshly and persecuted them. That's the fruit of a spirit of rejection. That as it gets down in our heart, many times the first expression of it is an anger toward those close to us. Many times to God. The prophet wasn't speaking on his own. He didn't come and say, hey, here's my opinion. He said, this is what the Lord says. That the eyes of the Lord are looking for those whose hearts are looking for him. And if you seek him, you'll be found by him. But your heart's turned away and you made a covenant that God told you not to make. That king can't help you like God can help you. And instead of being open and repenting, Asa's heart, anger entered his heart, and then he started acting harshly and treating people brutally. How often do we see it? The rise of domestic violence in the United States of America is skyrocketing. Why? I would say a spirit of rejection in people's life, that they're angry, that their life is the way it is, and they're, they're who they are, and they don't turn to God in the midst of that, and so they do exactly what Asa did. They're harsh to people. They, they imprison people. And, and we don't do that literally. We imprison people with our own unforgiveness. We lock them away, and we say, that's it. You're, you're, you're busted. Man, you're in solitary confinement. You ain't going to have a part in my life. We're locking you up. I'm locking you out. But then we begin to treat others brutally. We begin to take that anger that's in our heart, and we begin to express it. And instead of being gentle, instead of being loving, instead of being kind, and instead of letting the words of our mouth and the meditations of our heart be acceptable in the sight of God, we just say whatever we think because it's true. It's real. I'm just being real. It's keeping it real. Real bad. Real sad. Real sorry. What God wants for us is to turn our hearts toward him so that the overflow of our heart can be those rivers of life that he places in us, that Jesus said, if anybody believes in me, anybody who believes in me, that out of his uh, uh, inmost being shall flow rivers of living water. When we begin to live with an overflowing heart, it, it, it's that expression to God that causes people to turn to him and, and respond in an incredible way. Not us expressing God's anger, but like David praying, God, don't be angry with me. Don't hide from me. Don't stop helping me. The fourth thing was he asked God, God, don't leave me. Don't, don't leave me. The fifth one is God, don't forsake me. The, the, the essence there of rejection, a spirit of rejection, spirit of abandonment is to be forsaken. Somebody who committed decommits. Somebody said, no, I'll be here forever until I change my mind. Now I'm out of here. So what's happened to your forever? You started off living in a fairy tale. Now you feel like you're caught in a nightmare and you can't change. You want to keep turning the pages, but you're afraid of what's going to come next. David had such a desire for that for the security that comes in an ongoing relationship with God, not the hesitancy of, well, I know you're here, but are you going to leave? You know, sometimes when kids are growing up, they have separation anxiety. And, and if they can't see you and you're not present in the very same room, you might be in the house, you might be in the same vicinity, but they just, they need that assurance. Okay? So, sometimes they'll kind of cling to mama's coattails or whatever. They just want to be right there. Well, that's a good thing, but it's also kind of aggravating, right? H how do you help go through that? How do you help bring the security in their heart? Well, prayer, asking the Holy Spirit to do a work there, but there's nothing you can say, n no amount of assurances until you prove it by your actions. I'm always going to be here. I'm not going to leave. You know, we're going through it. Hey, I'm getting ready to leave, but I'm letting you know. And so we go through over and over and over. But it's not because you say it, because they sense it. And, and it's there. So David was like, God, you've been here and you've helped me. You've rescued me. Now don't stop and don't leave me. And then he said, and God, don't forsake me. Don't let me down. I know you can't fail, but don't fail. 
And, and don't, don't break your promise. Keep, keep that covenant and let's, let it be established here. Why is that important? Because the scripture says over and over again, God declaring to his people, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Jesus said to his disciples, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. He said, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. That he was saying, there's this aspect in our heart where we all feel abandoned, where we all feel forsaken, we all feel rejected, and nothing in life is going to fix it outside of a relationship with the Lord Jesus and being restored to the Father. The sad part is, I know so many believers who struggle in their hearts with a spirit of rejection and a spirit of abandonment because their heart didn't turn back to God in the midst of a trial, in the midst of the sting, when their life was shattered or whatever. We don't turn to God to put all the pieces back together again. And so we continue to struggle with, am I accepted? Am I, am I approved? Am I loved? Are you going to be here? But what happens if there's a bigger trial? And what happens when this comes and when that happens? And, and Lord, I know you've been here and you've been faithful and you've seen us through this, but, 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 and so we start living in fear rather than faith. And so we not only take God at his word, but we turn our hearts back and we open it up and out of an overflowing heart, pray that honest prayer. God, sometimes I struggle and I just, I just need to know you're here. And it's not, well, I'll tell you, that's tempting God. Don't tempt God. No. Gideon had this struggle and said, God, I just need a sign. You know, an angel appears to him, speaks to him, and he still needs a sign. Now, we laugh at Gideon because we're all looking in the mirror, right? Like, oh, geez. And we think, man, if an angel appeared to me, it's a done deal. Look, Jesus appeared to his disciples after the resurrection. Not an angel, Jesus, back from the dead. And they were afraid, and they were terrified, and they didn't get it. And so he repeated it, peace, peace. Now listen to me, okay? He'd walk through the wall, it freaked him out. Anybody walk through the wall at your house? Not the door, the wall. Not the window, Okay, and it's that whole deal of the natural reaction, but Jesus then speaks to their spirit. And it's exactly what's he, what he wants to do to all of us when we're insecure and when we're struggling and when we have separation anxiety. And, and he wants us to love people deeply from the heart, but he wants us also to realize w w th this isn't forever. That we're only going to have these natural bodies for a certain amount of time, and God knows when that time is, and we don't. But our hearts can turn to Him, and we will live forever. And that God's Spirit wants to connect with our spirit and bring the assurance and bring the comfort and bring the peace so that it's not us worrying about how many years do I have in my life, that we can live passionately saying, how much life can I cram into all these years because I just live with an overflowing heart? I can face my enemies, I can face difficulty, I can face disaster, I can make it through anything because God is with me. He will never leave me or forsake me. Can somebody say amen this morning? Amen. How many of you just say, man, that speaks to me. Speaks to me right where I'm at or what I'm walking through. There's all kinds of situations that, that we're facing today and it's not about a comparison. It's not about Horatio Spafford and it's one thing to lose a child prematurely, then lose four at once. It's one thing to go through a, a natural disaster and, and be devastated by a fire and it's, think, whatever. It's not about comparing circumstances and situations of, I, I, I did this or I did that. Well, I know what you're going through because I felt that too, that we have a tendency to compare what's well, not as bad as... Okay, but it's yours. It's your experience. And the awesome thing is that Jesus wants you to know that he wants to be your personal savior as well. The last line that 
David uh, writes there that we looked at this morning, verse 10, that the overflow of his heart was, had such confidence in God, such strength, that, that he said, Lord, don't, don't, uh, don't hide from me. Don't be angry with me. Don't, don't stop helping me. God, don't leave me and don't forsake me. He, he's expressing that to God, but then the, the confident expression was the ultimate abandonment, the ultimate rejection is even if my parents, my mother and my father rejected me, God, you'll take care of me. One translation said, you'll hold me close. It, it's God scooping us up because all of us, feel that sense of abandonment and rejection, not just from people, but because our lives are cut off and separated from our Father, God. And that Jesus comes and he not only makes that place for us to be reconnected with him in our hearts through turning our hearts toward him and repenting of sin, opening our hearts to him and saying, Lord Jesus, not only do I believe and want you to be Lord of my life, but then he fills us with his spirit which is the spirit of sonship or the spirit of adoption, the Holy Spirit. And the awesome part is Romans chapter 8 tells us that his spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the sons and daughters of God. And if we're sons and daughters, then we're heirs and we're co-heirs with Jesus. What does that mean? It means God doesn't play favorites. And God doesn't do generic brand. That God made you so unique and loves you so uniquely that you will never find fulfillment, strength, purpose outside of that love. There is nothing else that compares. No other love like God can love. And so we don't have to present a message of anger because God's not angry with us. God's angry with the enemy. God's angry that people choose sin and God's angry that people don't turn to him in that sense. He's not angry at the people. His heart's broken for them. The shortest verse in the Bible is also one of the most profound. That Jesus was God. He was w w going to the grave to raise Lazarus from the dead. But yet he stopped and the scripture says, Jesus wept. Not only does he feel and experience what we're walking through in that sense of loss, you're thinking, if you're going to raise him from the dead and you know that you're going to raise him from the dead and you're just going to pray a prayer and God's going to raise him up and you're going to call him forth, what are you crying about? You cry, baby. It wasn't that. It's that Jesus was moved. And there's this impact of that. And how many of us go through situations? We think, man, I always cry at weddings. I always cry at funerals. It's always difficult. To... There are certain things that move us. And the incredible thing is that when Jesus demonstrated a relationship with the Father, it wasn't this mechanical thing that uh, all you got to do is you got to pray, and you got to pray this prayer, and you got to pray this way. It was that sense of the Father met him with incredible compassion because he was so moved. He saw how much pain Lazarus' sisters were in. It moved him. And, and, and as he's praying, he kneels down to pray, but he weeps. And so, oh, look how much he loved him. It was his love for Lazarus, but it was also his love for each one of us. That if you were in the grave, and it wasn't God's time for you, that God sends Jesus to speak a word and says, Lazarus, come forth. John, come forth. Mary, come forth. Come on, get out of there. Ethan, get out of that place where death has you trapped and get out of here and start walking in life. God's not finished with you yet. Come on, somebody. How easy is that to live with an overflowing heart? It didn't, it didn't fix Lazarus' life. I think one of the most frustrating verses in the Bible for me is that then after Lazarus was raised from the dead, the, the Pharisees continued to try to kill Jesus and Lazarus too because Jesus raised him from the dead. Talk about can't win for losing. No, wait, can't lose for winning. <laughs> well, he's dead, now he's back to life, now we're trying to kill him. Ah, oh, jeez. Okay, those are the times when we need to have some declaration and find some solid ground. I don't know about you, but I'm gonna live life strong. I'm just declaring it. 
Doesn't mean I'm never going to be weak. Doesn't mean I'm not going to struggle. Doesn't mean I'm not going to get back a little bit. But I'm going to find my strength in God. I'm going to live life strong. And then my heart's going to turn and live with passion for God's house. Not, not just a casual type of thing. I, I, I want motion Sunday every Sunday. Amen. Amen. And, 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 and how do we get that? We, we, we let God work in our lives and lift us and hold our heads high. And how do we maintain that? Then we choose to live with an overflowing heart. We don't let it just get dried up and shriveled up and whatever. We let God's life flow out of us as much as he's pouring into us. And then what do we do? We make a determination that no matter what comes into my life, no matter what happens, no matter what's unexpected, no matter what's difficult, my heart is going to turn back to God in all things and at all times. And when we do we will live on solid ground because we will live in a place where Christ wants us to live. Would you bow your heads with me this morning? Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, I am so grateful for the awesome work you're doing in the lives of these great kids. Lord, I love to see the fruit of faithful parenting and love to see the fruit of hearts that turn to you love what you're doing and raising up leadership and those that have hearts willing to give their own time, uh, pay their own expenses, Lord, just to be there in an environment. But I thank you that sowing and reaping is a powerful, powerful thing. We get to experience the results of that as we respond to you, as you pour into their hearts and they choose to open their hearts and celebrate with us, share what God's doing. Father, we don't even have to have specific testimony. We see the result of changed lives. Lord, for every one of us. We don't have to look at resentment. Man, I wish I could do that. I wish I could go back. I wish I could be young again. I wish I had the enthusiasm, the strength, the lungs, the knees to dance like that. I wish, Lord, we don't have to look back in regret. We can make a declaration in our heart, I'm gonna live my life strong, strong in the spirit. That, that my heart is going to be that passionate for your house as well. Father, my heart's going to turn to you and this morning I pray that that would be the case. Father, that every heart in this house would turn to you. Every hurting heart, every lonely heart, every broken heart. Lord, every heart that's confused, every heart that's struggling, every heart that's become hardened by sin, every heart would turn back to you. Father, I pray that you would silence the voice of the accuser, the enemy of our souls, and that our hearts would hear you speak. Like David said, my heart has heard you say, come and seek my face. So Lord, I'm coming. I'm responding. I'm saying yes to God. I'm going to ask you very simply this morning to respond to what the Spirit of God is speaking to you. Not just to us, but to you individually. And I'm going to ask you to make a declaration no matter where you are that you'll just determine today my heart's going to turn to God. Maybe you feel like God's hidden from you or, or your situation is more difficult than you had anticipated or it's it stayed longer or it's more intense or maybe you felt like you, you're not just hit, you're buffeted. That if you make a determination and a declaration this morning, my heart's going to turn to God. That God's heart is already turned toward you. And it's like he had a message for you this morning. Listen, I know where you are and I know what you need. And so he brings us into an environment where we can simply respond to him I'm going to ask you this morning if you're here and especially if you would say that your heart is turned away from God and you want to turn it back or you don't know you haven't understood how to respond to that or open your heart to God maybe you felt like he was angry with you so you're still hiding but if you'll open your heart to God and turn it toward Him, His compassion, He will pour out upon you. What an awesome thing to find your help in God. Know that He'll be there for you. 
Others that would say, man, the situation I'm in and what I'm walking through is really causing me to struggle. David finished this song of this exuberant declaration of praise saying, I would have lost heart unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Listen, when you make a determination to live with a strong heart and to live life strong, it doesn't mean that there are not going to be times where you feel like giving up. I would have despaired. I would have lost heart unless I believed. I want you to know this morning that Jesus declared to those who are listening to him, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he sent. It's not doing works for God, hoping he'll love you more. It's doing the work of believing. And keep believing. And stay believing. And stand on what you believe. And it opens God's heart to flow to you in unprecedented ways. So if you're here this morning and you just say, Pastor, I'm declaring this morning that my heart's going to turn to God. Every situation, for whatever it is, we don't even need to know the details, but you just say, my heart's turning to God right now. For the first time, or it's turning back again, or in the midst of my trial, in the midst of my difficulty, my heart's turning to God. I, don't, I not only want you to make that determination in your heart, I want you to raise your hand and just to say, I'm, I'm committing to that this morning. My heart's turning to God. Come on all over the building. Hands going up. Hands going up. Hands going up. Up in the balcony. Very good. Up in the upper seats. My heart's turning back to God. Young people, my heart's turning to God. I know I just came back from motion, but there's an area of my heart that needs to be open to the Lord. God's speaking to me this morning. Come on, lift your hands. My heart's turning to God. Now, if you have your hand raised, just lift the other one. Come on, lift it up like a funnel and get ready to receive what God wants to pour out in your life this morning. Father, in Jesus' mighty name, to every person with their hand raised, every person with their heart open, I thank you that you are not angry. I thank you that you do not treat us harshly. You do not treat us as our sins deserve, but great is your compassion. Father, that your favor lasts for a lifetime. And when our hearts turn back to you, we come back into a realm of favor, of blessing, of God's grace, of God's love. And Father, I pray that you would pour it out into our hearts right now. Father, let it wash out the hurt and the bitterness. Let it wash out the pain and the sting of words that have been spoken, that have pierced us like a sword. Father, let healing come to the places in our hearts where we're wounded. And Father, I pray that as our hearts turn to you, it's not out of weakness, it's to receive the strength, the healing, the power that is ours in God and a relationship that brings such confidence and comfort to us that we never want to turn away, that our hearts continually want to turn back to you. I will turn to God at all times. Father, thank you for it. We give you praise and glory and honor heads bowed and eyes closed. I want our prayer teams to slip out from where you are. In fact, if I can have Ethan, some of our young people and, and leaders help us as well this morning. If you come here across the front, some of you may want to come to the back. I, I just want to take some time. We've got a few minutes this morning before we dismiss. And I just want to take time to respond to what God's speaking to us personally and individually. You may want to just connect with somebody else in prayer. You may want to be at that place just to say, uh, I'm making this declaration in my life this morning. Maybe it is a place where you're still struggling. And, and how do I do this? How do I walk into this? How, how do I make sure my heart's totally turning uh, to God this morning? We're just here to help you. We're here to connect with you. We're here just to, to uh, respond in obedience to what the word says. Pray one for another that you might be healed. There's healing in the house this morning for our physical bodies, for our hearts, for our emotions, for our thoughts, healing from a past, healing from what, what we're walking through. God takes us and takes us out of a pit and sets us on a rock to display his glory in our life. Can you say amen? So we just worship here for a moment, sit in the presence of the Lord. I just invite you to slip out from where you are and let's just pray one for another for a few moments and seal what God's doing in our lives this morning. Uh, find that place of prayer. 
uh, if that's a word that God gives somebody to speak over your life, how powerful that is to know not only is God speaking generally, God speaking specifically in our lives of what we need. Come on, can you all stand together? If you want to come and receive prayer, just slip out from where you are. Let's do that. Not Let's just pray. Let, let the Spirit of God just work in us this morning. Give Him some time. I said a few weeks ago, we can't make God move, but we can certainly make room for God to move. So make room in your heart this morning. Let's respond to God. Amen? Come on, go. I invite you. Slip out.
no place I would rather be. There's no place I would rather be than hearing your love, hearing your love. There's no place I would rather be. There's no place I would rather be. There's no place I would rather be than hearing your love, hearing your love. Sing that with me. There's no place I would rather be. There's no place I would rather. Set a fire, set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, I can't control. Cause I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. Set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, I can't control. Cause I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. Pray with me this morning. If you're receiving prayer, just continue to do so. If not, if you would, just lift your hands to the Lord one more time. Father, I just thank you that when our hearts turn to you at all times, that's exactly what we receive, more of you and less of us. Father, that we can release out of our life things that hinder that relationship so we have more room to receive into our life, into our hearts, everything that you want to pour into us. Lord, I thank you that you are not enough in every situation. You are too much. You are overwhelming. You are more than enough. And so, Father, I pray that out of that strength and confidence, our hearts would continually turn to you, and you would meet us here in a powerful way. Thank you for the work you've done, the work you've begun. That's what you're going to continue to do. And thank you, Lord, that every time our hearts turn to you, we, we find that same strength and life and love. For your love never fails. In Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. Hey, want to remind everybody? Amen. Rejoice in God. That's good. Real quick before you go, I want to remind everybody that um, motion testimonies are going to be Wednesday night. And so the young people will be joining us again. You can hear about it, what God was speaking, how he was working. And so find somebody around you. Greet them in the name of the Lord. Encourage them. Take them to lunch, whatever they look like they need. Men live with an overflowing heart. Join us again Wednesday night, 6.30, Sunday morning, 10 o'clock. Look forward to it. God bless you.